welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we're kicking off a party. What party? A week-long celebration of crop wild relatives. Running from September 22nd to the 29th, 2018, we'll be featuring blog posts, infographics, and more on the Crop Science Society of America's website. Link available in the show notes. What are crop wild relatives? How do we use them? What steps are we taking to catalog and protect these valuable resources? Answers to all these and more with special guest Dr. Stephanie Green coming right up. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Everybody, welcome to the show today. This is a special episode we're doing for Crop Wild Relatives Week. I also want to apologize up front. I am fighting a bit of a cold this week, so I sound a little stuffy, but hopefully you can forgive me and still enjoy the show and our wonderful guest today. Her name is Stephanie. So hi, Stephanie. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Awesome. So Stephanie, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself to get started, maybe some of your educational or personal background that got you into your science? Okay, well, I went to school at the University of Idaho and Kansas State University because I was really into plant breeding. Um, But it was by working on my PhD in wild sorghum that I realized how important wild diversity can be in breeding and how genetic resources need to be conserved so they're available to be used. So, of course, after graduating, I actually started working for the USDA National Plant Germplasm System. This is our nation's gene bank that conserves genetic resources that we use for breeding. Our mission is to conserve and promote the use of a broad range of genetic diversity, including crop wild relatives. So I've actually been working in the gene bank since I got out of grad school. For about 19 years, I curated the alfalfa and clover collections. And more recently, I'm now curating the um, National Plant Germplasm System Safety Backup Seed Collection here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Can you tell me more about the differences between gene banks and seed collections, what both of them do, what they're used for, how they work together? Well, a gene bank and a seed collection are generally the same thing, just big collections of seed, or it could be clonally propagated material like cuttings. What they're used for are basically they're a reservoir that plant breeders can draw from. Gene banks is just the more scientific term because what we're doing is storing genes that can be used by breeders. Seed collections are oftentimes their seed collections that have been put together by folks who are interested in preserving, say, heirloom varieties, like there's the Seed Savers Exchange, and they've got a large seed collection. There's also the Native Seed Search uh, folks that are down in the southwest in Tucson, and they're conserving southwestern varieties that have been developed over the years. But essentially, it's, it, you can use the terms interchangeably. That's good to know. One question I have about gene banks and seed collections and all that kind of thing is, do they work together much? I mean, you mentioned a few different groups. So obviously, you know, some of them are government, some of them are not. Do they talk to each other or work together on things? How does that work? Yeah, well, they definitely work together. For the USDA, so for the nation's collection, we actually have about 19 different gene banks spread across the United States. Each of these gene banks is responsible for a set of collections. For example, in Geneva, New York, we've got the apple collection, and we also have the tomato collection. In Washington State, we have a big gene bank that has probably about 70,000 accessions, vegetables, temperate forages, food legumes, so like lentils and chickpeas and beans. So anyway, from a federal perspective, we've got this very large network of gene banks across the country. And then on a non-federal level, we have our nonprofits, for example, Seed Savers Exchange, although they do sell heirloom seeds, but uh, they do have an important collection where they're preserving heirloom varieties. 
and then also native seed search. And then a lot of botanical gardens have seed collections. One way that the federal, we support each other is that, for example, here in Fort Collins, we will store safety backup copies, essentially, of these nonprofit collections. So we have copies of Seed Savers Exchange collection and the Native Seed Search, and then also quite a number of botanical gardens. We will store their collections. Basically, they're a backup copy in case something happens at their sites, the collections won't be lost. That's so cool. I am so fascinated by these, and I'm not sure where that stems from, but I just, I think they're one of the most fascinating things. But what we're talking about today is actually another fascinating topic of crop wild relatives. So can you give us an overview of what they are, what they're used for? Tell me about them. Okay, so a crop wild relative is, if you think of a crop plant, for example, wheat or corn, those are the poodles of the botanical world. They've been domesticated, they've been bred, they do pretty much what we'd like them to do. A crop wild relative is a wild species that is genetically very, very close to a crop species. And so if a crop is a poodle, then a crop wild relative is the wolf. It's the wild version. It's adapted to the environment that it's been growing in. Frequently, it has pretty interesting traits. It can have disease or insect resistance, or it can be adapted to adverse conditions. So it can have drought tolerance, or it might be able to grow in a very saline soil. Because they're so closely related, plant breeders can transfer useful wild traits into our cultivated crops. This diversifies the genetic base of our crops, uh, which ultimately is going to increase our food security. Uh, North America is actually uh, surprisingly rich in crop wild relative species. In the United States, we have crop wild relatives of sunflower, grape, cranberry, strawberry, blueberry, a lot of fruits and nuts. But we also have some other important species, for example, for corn, for maize. Mm. And how do you tell apart a normal poodle from one of these wolves? Well, a normal poodle is going to have a specific shape. It's going to be a certain size. It's going to have a certain kind of hair, and it's going to weigh a certain amount. So there's basically standards, and that's what our crops have. We want them to produce a certain amount of grain. We want them to be uniform so we can harvest them at the same time in the field. We want to be able to plant the field, and we want all the wheat to pop up at the same time. And so we've got our standards for crops the exact same way that we have standards for dog breeds. A crop wild relative, however, doesn't really have any standards. We have not done anything with it in terms of any sort of artificial selection. And so it is going to look like a wild critter. There's different sizes, different shapes. There's a lot of variation within a, a single population. You can go out and take a look at a crop wild relative population that's growing in a specific location and these individual plants are going to be flowering and maturing at different times. There's just a lot of variation within a single population, uh, which is great for the wild species because that helps it adapt to, you know, any kind of adverse conditions. However, it's very difficult to manage such a heterogeneous population in a field, in a field that we want to, you know, we want some sort of uniformity. And so I think the biggest difference is that a crop wild relative, they're very heterogeneous. They have lots of variation in them. And on one hand, that variation is wonderful because there are potentially useful traits that we can use. But on the other hand, that variation is difficult to manage in an agricultural setting. Do people who do the kind of work that you do, are you guys just really good at identifying them? Like if you're just 
on a hike, are you able to be like, oh, that's wild raspberry and that's, or, or are they harder? <laughs> Cause if I, if I was doing your work, I would just constantly be like pointing out to all of my friends, <laughs> every wild thing that I see. Is that something that you guys do? Well, I certainly do it. Uh, I do a lot of hiking here in, in Colorado, and I am constantly on the lookout for crop wild relatives and always have to stop and take photos when I see them, um, which is kind of <laughs> irritates my friends. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, when I'm hiking, I there are raspberries. I see those all the time and strawberries. We've got, um, we even have a wild hop. Hops is used to brew beer, and we have a wild, a native hop here in Colorado that's a crop wild relative. Oh, and you can't forget the sunflowers. Sunflowers are pretty easy to identify, and there's lots of wild sunflowers here in the United States. You know, you kind of get an eye. They do look like the crop. I mean, if you grow raspberries, if you were walking in the wild, you could definitely pick up on those crop wild relatives that are berries. Also, the strawberries, you can, you know, again, if you grow strawberries, you can readily identify a wild strawberry. I mean, the leaves are smaller, the fruits are much, much smaller, but they, you know, they look like strawberries. Do the wild relatives, do they look more similar to each other? I mean, is it pretty easy to tell them apart or how do you know when you have a new wild one? So thankfully, we have had botanists on the ground for quite some time. And so they have an understanding of what species are related to other species. And so for the most part, we have a pretty good handle on what our crop wild relative species are. It would be pretty darn exciting if we discovered a new crop wild relative species. Because I think that, again, there's been a lot of historical work that's been done on wild species and understanding what their taxonomic relationships are. And again, because they are related to crop plants, I think there's been more interest in studying them in the past. And so so we are fortunate in that we do have an understanding. In some cases, though, we might not truly understand how closely related a given crop wild relative is to another wild related species. So we might still need to do work to understand, well, can they cross with each other? Do they form hybrids? Is it a hybrid that we see out in the wild or is it truly a, a different species? And so we still need to work on understanding these relationships. And then of course, the central relationship that we're most interested in from an agricultural perspective is, can these wild species be crossed with our crop species? That's the key piece of information that we need to know. And that's how we can sort of rank the value of our crop wild relatives. We're most interested in those wild species that are very closely related to our crop species because they're much easier to work with. We can make a cross. The hybrids that are formed are vigorous and viable, and we can grow them out in the field, and we can select, you know, to further our breeding objective. If it's a distant relative, we need to start doing more heroic measures when we make these crosses between wild and cultivated species. We have to do things like rescue embryos in the lab because there's some barriers that prevent a hybrid from developing in the first place. And so, you know, we will need to do these more elaborate measures to make sure that we have hybrids that we can then work with in terms of transferring that useful wild gene into our cultivated species. Excellent. That sounds like just some really great work. And it's very exciting to hear you talk about rescue missions for these plants. I just love your passion for your work. That's so wonderful and delightful. But moving on, there are some problems or maybe challenges that you do run up against in working with these species. So can you tell me what some of those are? So yes, there are challenges to working with crop wild relatives. Our problem is actually threefold. One, we need to conserve the crop wild relatives in gene banks and in nature. There's a couple of issues 
with conserving crop wild relative. Uh, the first is that it's going to take a broad group of partners to successfully do the job. And second, we're finding that conserving wild species is much more difficult than conserving domesticated species in a gene bank. Again, it's because they're just so variable. The second problem we have is that we don't know exactly where they occur in terms of where they are on the landscape. And then our final challenge is actually using the crop wild relatives. When you cross a poodle to a wolf, you get a shaggy hybrid. Uh, what you really want is to get back to your poodle as quickly as possible. And so it takes a lot of crossing back to the poodle to get something useful. It's also hard to know from a superficial look what crop wild relatives can contribute. For example, there was a wild tomato from Ecuador and Peru that had very small green fruits. However, when they crossed it with some commercial tomato varieties, the hybrids were identical that actually had larger fruits and more red pigments than the commercial variety. So it ended up that this small, wild, green-fruited species ended up being able to contribute these very useful alleles to the commercial variety that ended up resulting in larger fruit and more red pigments. So that was a real surprise, and that's just the way the nature of working with crop wild relatives is you just have a tough time figuring out uh, what could be useful in them just from a physical, the superficial look at, you know, what do they look like in the greenhouse or out in the field. So increasingly, we're turning to um, molecular genetic approaches that give us a better idea of how useful genes are in a crop wild relative. And they're proven to be pretty helpful in uncovering useful wild genes that might not be apparent when we look at a wild species. And then another aspect is these genetic tools allow us to increase the efficiency of identifying hybrids that are poodles with just a touch of wool. So that's our goal is to find these poodles with just a bit of the wild genome that has a useful trait that we're interested in. So by using these molecular genetic approaches, plant breeders can incorporate useful wild genes into new varieties um, much more quickly than they have in the past, although it's still a tough problem. And if you ask any plant breeder, if a useful trait occurs in a cultivated variety, they will use that variety first and foremost because it's easy to work with. They tend only to turn to the wild material as a last resort. But again, with our molecular genetic tools, it's getting easier to do this. And that increases the value of our crop wild relatives. So in facing those challenges, you guys have kind of been laying some of the groundwork to really get a handle on what is even out there. One of those efforts was the inventory of North American wild relatives. Can you tell me about some of that work? Sure. So our work has really focused on understanding exactly what crop wild relatives occur in North America and where they occur. We published an inventory on crop wild relatives in the United States. The inventory contained about 4,500 species, and we identified out of these species about 250 that were high priority to conserve because they are relatives of important crops, for example, wheat and maize and sunflower. If you take a look, there's actually it's international efforts to make these crop wild relative inventories because that's the first step in the process of conserving these important genetic resources. You really need to know what you have in your own backyard. Uh, Mexico just published their inventory, and I know that Canada is getting geared up and has that as a high priority to develop their own inventory. So how do we, what are the steps involved in creating an inventory? So to compile the inventory, we reviewed databases and research literature and basically assembled a list using these materials. We wanted to assemble a list of species that were both native and naturalized in the United States that were close relative to species we use in food and agriculture. We also included species that are used in their wild form. 
For example, many species are used medicinally or for revegetation or animal forage. They haven't actually been domesticated, but we use them all the time. So altogether, we came up with a list of about 4,500 taxa. About 2,500, so about half of these, were crop wild relatives. Our next step then was to prioritize the inventory because there's no way we can focus on conserving all of these species. It would take forever. So what we wanted to do was identify the most important crop wild relative based on how globally important the crop was and how close genetically the wild relative was to its cultivated cousin. Basically, we wanted to identify crop wild relatives that were most valuable to breeders. So these are the wild species that absolutely need to be protected and made available in gene banks. In the end, we identified 250 high priority crop wild relatives that occur in the United States. This included many relatives of fruit and nut crops, but also relatives of wheat, barley, cotton, and sunflower, among others. And after you had these inventories completed, I understand that you had a couple of resources that came out of this. Uh, looks like a book and some maps. Can you tell me more about those? Yeah. Oh, we just completed a book on North American crop wild relatives. It should be published this fall. And what it does, this book actually compiles what we know about crop wild relatives in North America. So it includes not only the United States, but also Canada and Mexico. It's a pretty big book. It's in two volumes. And we have over 80 authors that contributed to 30 chapters. Something that was really awesome about this book is that we were also able to develop and include species distribution maps for about 600 species. So what we did was we took the most up-to-date current information. So basically, we had the map coordinates of where species had been either collected or where there were herbarium samples. And we were able to do modeling that then projected or predicted what the geographic distribution was of these species. And so this is providing the most up-to-date information on where these important species occur. So the book then has chapters that cover all of these species in terms of what they're used for, you know, how much they're used in breeding, where they occur, um, what are some of the intricacies in using these species. And it basically is going to be a great reference to help people understand where the crop wild relatives occur um, and what their value is. And so we're pretty excited about that, about the book coming out. Yeah, congratulations on your forthcoming publication. That's wonderful news. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the show. Want to find out more about today's topic? Our Crop Wild Relatives Week webpage has all kinds of resources, from blog posts to infographics, videos, and even a collection of related research. In addition, our featured article for today, An Inventory of Crop Wild Relatives of the United States, published in Crop Science, is always freely available on our digital library. You can find a link to it in our show notes. Let's get back to the show. Then you're also moving on to the next stage then, now that you kind of have your base level of what's in the backyard, and you're doing something called a gap analysis. Can you tell me what a gap analysis is? Okay, so our crop wild relative inventory was basically just a list of crop wild relatives, a prioritized list, so we know which are the most important that can be used by plant breeders. However, the inventory doesn't tell us where gaps in our gene bank collections occur, nor where we need to make actual collections on the ground. So this is what a gap analysis is going to tell us. And also, where are crop wild relatives naturally protected in the environment? Where do they occur on land that's already protected? Another thing our gap analysis can tell us is where are the hot spots that occur? Where are areas where there are a large number of crop wild relatives 
because again, focusing on hotspot areas makes for a much more efficient collection and conservation. And how do you actually do a gap analysis? What steps are involved with that? Well, basically a gap analysis pulls information from three domains. The first domain is geography, which we use as a proxy for genetic diversity. Since we assume that the genetic range of a species is gonna encompass the diversity or all the traits that are found in the species. The second domain is the environment, such as climate and soil, which again is a proxy for abiotic traits, such as drought tolerance. And the third domain is taxonomy, which includes all those related species, which are presumed to have potentially useful adaptations for plant breeders to use. So the steps of a gap analysis are to gather occurrence data on where our wild species occur. So what we're looking at here is the latitude and longitude, actual map coordinates of where we have found these wild species to occur in the past. We then gather together a bunch of environmental data sets, such as climate or soils. And then the third step is to actually conduct the gap analysis, which entails running models and algorithms that predict where our crop wild relatives are going to occur geographically. And then what we do is we compare the geographic and environmental coverage. We compare that to what is actually present in gene bank samples. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, okay, do our gene bank samples give us all of our geographic coverage of these particular crop wild relatives? Because basically what we want to do is we want to make sure that what we have in our gene banks represents what's actually out there in the wild. And we want to have representation of the entire geographic range of a species. So basically then the gap analysis, what we'll come away with after we complete the analysis is that we can identify where we have gaps for crop wild relatives. We can then prioritize these gaps. We can figure out, well, which are the gaps most important to fill first? And so we will assign collecting priorities for specific species and for specific areas where we need to be collecting them. We can also do a gap analysis that examines the extent that crop wild relatives are already protected in nature. So basically, instead of using gene bank data, what we're going to be using is data that defines areas that already have protection. For example, this could be Forest Service land, BLM land, so basically federally protected lands. And we can see what sort of overlap do we have with where crop wild relatives occur and how many of them occur in areas that are already protected. What this will help us do then is, it, well, at least gives us a sense of, okay, which of the crop wild relatives are protected or have some level of protection in the wild? And where are areas where we can focus our attention on to develop nature reserves that will perhaps provide protection to an important hotspot area? That's wonderful. I, <laughs> I, Maybe I just like action movies too much, but I love hearing about this because I just get this mental image of the dark room with four techs hammering away at keyboards, making all these models, and then sending out stray teams to like gather these plants that are in danger. And I just, I love it. I think it's so wonderful. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's probably not like that at all, but it's all very like high tech, uh, just action movie thriller in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it really is important work. So what are some of the really practical implications of the work that you're doing? Why is this so crucial? Well, the implications for our work are that we're basically setting the stage with the necessary information that we need to move forward in an efficient and an effective manner to secure our crop wild relatives. So we are basically a bunch of nerds sitting around running our models on our computer, but what we're gonna be able to do is at the end is to definitely provide a very distinct plan of action so that we can send out our collectors to go and secure our most important crop wild relatives. 
And that's pretty exciting to do because, you know, the bottom line is that these crop wild relatives are disappearing. They are threatened. And we do need to get out there now and secure them and make sure that they're in gene banks where they can be easily accessed by plant breeders. And what are some of the next steps for your research once you have that plan of action or even in just working with these varieties in general? What what are some of the next stages for the research community with this? Well, I think the, the next stage is um, once our gap analysis is done, we will have a strategy in place almost a roadmap in terms of what needs to be protected. So now what we're doing is we are, you know, it's it's one thing to have a strategy in place, but what you also need to do is you need to galvanize action. You need to make people aware that this problem exists and that there's a solution so that you can implement action. And so I think at this point in time, we are, first of all, making a roadmap in terms of a strategy for crop wild relatives in the United States. But we've also been spending a lot of time basically raising awareness, particularly among land managers. So most of the conservation world, the focus has been on rare and endangered plant species. First of all, there are not a lot of resources out there to protect biodiversity. And so the focus has been on rare and endangered species. But what we're trying to do is help people understand that actually there is a set of wild species that may not be rare and endangered, although some of them certainly are. But these are wild species that really have a high value in supporting food security, essentially. These are the resources that our plant breeders need to turn to, to look for useful traits to transfer into our cultivated crops. Again, that was a focus of our book, was just raising awareness, hey, there are these important wild species, they might not be rare and endangered, in fact, they are common and often weedy. However, they do have value and they need to be conserved. And so I think, you know, this combination of number one, providing a roadmap, this is how we can secure our crop wild relatives in the United States. And number two, raising awareness among a broad number of partners. So our land managers, you know, the USDA Agricultural Research Service, who they support our plant breeders, our public plant breeders, and scientists, botanical gardens, all of these partners can play a role in securing our crop wild relatives. And so that's our goal is to, again, make folks aware of the importance of crop wild relatives so that we can secure them. One of the things I wanted to talk about is why we are doing this specific episode when we're doing it, and that is Crop Wild Relatives Week. It's going to be this coming week, September 22nd through the 29th, 2018. And you were really involved in this effort. Can you tell me kind of how that started and some of the things that you were involved with with that? Sure. So I, the Tri Societies really recognizes the importance of crop wild relatives. And so is having this week to, again, help us raise awareness of the issue. We've got a lot of things planned for the week One of the things that I've been involved in is basically putting together a set of blogs. What we're doing is I've got a blog that basically gives an overview of the issues. And then we have other blogs that are more, more fun and crop specific. For example, we have a blog on one of the early plant explorers who collected a lot of crop wild relatives. And then also we have blogs that talk about sunflowers and cranberries and even one on sweet potatoes, which really get into a little more detail on how important crop wild relatives are for these crops. We're also going to have a resources list with a bunch of different journal articles from our journals that are all related to crop wild relatives, including the article that you and your team did for the inventory that you did for the United States. And we're also going to have some fun infographics with information on crop wild relatives and all of this information, you can find a link to it in the show notes. Speaking of, 
I've got three questions left for you. The first of which is if people are interested in crop wild relatives and they would like to learn more, where can they go for more information? So in addition to all of the references that are going to be listed on our Crop Wild Relative Week website, there's also been some substantial global efforts to conserve crop wild relatives. And so if you'll look in the notes from this blog, we've listed the links that you can go to to get more information on that. And then we also have a U.S. crop wild relative blog, which would be a good place to go to, to subscribe to. It provides an overview of the efforts that we've done to date. And then also be a good place to get updates as our project um, moves forward. One of the things that we're hoping to do is launch a citizen science project. We're not quite there yet, but we are talking about it. And if you subscribe to the U.S. Crop Wild Relative blog, we will put updates there so that we can get as many people involved as possible. Great. So that covers part of my second question, but I'm sure there's more. So if people want to get involved or help with some of these issues, what can they do to help? Well, I think at this point, you know, the best thing to do is just become informed on the subject area. And again, there's lots of resources out there that we have for you to look at. I think it's important then to spread the information so listeners can discuss their concerns with others. And then again, we can Once we do have a citizen science project up and running, sign up for that. Those sound like some great ways for people to get involved. Final question for you. What is one fun fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? Well, people probably wouldn't know that I recently made this interesting discovery in regards to my cat. So my cat is named Kevin, and he goes outside and he likes to hunt insects. He started coming in the house foaming at the mouth and I did not know what was going on. But I recently discovered that actually what he's been doing is he's playing with Colorado woodhouse toads. (laughs) They have this toxin in their skin. Yeah. And it it makes animals uh, foam at the mouth. So anyway, I'm hoping that Kevin's going to learn his lesson pretty quickly. Yeah, hopefully. What kind of cat? Oh, he's just a a gray and white cat. (laughs) Still sounds beautiful. I'm sure he's lovely. (laughs) He is. (laughs) Um, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for all of the information. It has been so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and being willing to reschedule around my getting this cold. Um, So, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe. And don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. This podcast is a joint production of the Tri-Societies, the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers. Oh,